what are we doing today? Is this, we're gonna look at what sustainable tourism is, um, what SkyRail is and what the product is, what our values are as a company, um, how and why we do that, okay, and the social, environmental and economic impacts that the business has, but also our initiatives that try and uh, keep that as sustainable as we can, all right? So that's what I'm gonna talk about, but like I said, please uh, stop me anytime. So, sustainable tourism, Lots of definitions of it, but the most basic one is to meet the needs of the present without compromising the needs of future generations. I'm sure you've probably heard that at all, um, all before. But to do that, we've got to take into consideration the environmental impact that we're having, the social impact and benefits that we can create, and the economic, obviously. If we're not making money, we don't get to run. So we holistically look at that at SkyRail, just, um, I'll talk about what SkyRail's values are in a second, um, but the owner of this business 28 years ago, um, sustainable tourism wasn't such a big thing back then, it was just build it and they will come sort of thing, but he was big, on, well, sorry, the family was big on those three principles. So I'll talk about what we're doing to try and improve social, especially social and environmental uh, initiatives locally. All right. What should operators do? So we're in the tourism business. Cairns used to, before COVID, let's forget about COVID for a minute. We were the fourth biggest airport in Australia for inter international tourists. And it was almost solely on uh, sustainable tourism or tourism initiatives. So we've got the Great Barrier Reef here, which I know you all enjoyed a couple of days ago. Um, we've got the World, Wet Tropics um, World Heritage Rainforest, which you're about to experience today. And with that, we've got a whole lot of other produce and things like that that we produce, but it really is a tourism town. Okay, so Cairns was built actually 120 years ago. Port Douglas, I don't know if anyone's, have you been up to Port Douglas? Little town, 50 kilometers to the north of us, uh, only a couple of thousand people. It was the main hub of far north Queensland. But uh, Cairns took off because we, they, they built a railway up onto the tablelands and that allowed people to access gold and timber, okay? So Cairns was a tiny little base and then it, it boomed because of the railway. And then in the 1980s, um, the Japanese especially uh, had direct flights into Cairns and that's when the international airport started. And we had a lot of Japanese investment along with the Australian government and built what you see as Cairns today. So if you take all of the I know they're not high, high rises, but if you take all of the multi-storey buildings away from the Esplanade, um, before the 1980s, there was nothing like that, okay? So I guess what I'm saying is Cairns is fairly recent into the tourism game, but now that the Great Barrier Reef and this rainforest has World Heritage status, it's really uh, boomed. And when you get on the cableway, have a look to your north, there's a, all of those houses that you will see didn't exist. 20, 25 years ago, okay? So it was a very sleepy tropical town uh, that's turned into uh, an international, fourth biggest in, in Australia, international tourism hub. So everyone that wants to do backpacking uh, or spend a bit of time, they either fly into Melbourne or Sydney and fly out of here, or they fly into Cairns and fly out of Melbourne or Sydney because it's a fantastic sort of one-way route down the coast. So um, because we're in that environment, um, that's where they decided to build this uh, cableway. What should we be doing? We should be protecting the natural environment, obviously, conserving heritage and biodiversity. I'll tell you all about our biodiversity soon. Um, contribute to intercultural understanding. We are right now in the middle of Jabagai country. Jabagai are the cultural people um, of this land and have been here for 60,000 years plus. So. It's the oldest continually surviving culture in the world. Um, they have so much to give to us. Uh, we are only just scratching the surface uh, at making use of that knowledge. Okay, so I don't know if you know about the history of um, European settlement in Australia, but it hasn't been a pretty one for you know, a lot of reasons. So, you know, progress, we're, we're known as a lucky country and Europeans have, you know, made a really good fist of it since they've moved over here. Um, me being one of them, you know, it's a, it's a fantastic place to live. Uh, but we have left the um, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander story behind. 
Jabbergite people have so much to give up, give to us, and um, this company is committed to learning more. Uh, and Two Way Street, you know, talking about Jabbergai and learning more about um, the rainforest here, but also giving back and providing opportunities for the local Jabbergai people too. So we need to contribute to that understanding, otherwise we're not doing our job properly. Um, obviously, we need to provide an economic benefit uh, for the local community. Um, a meaningful experience. Hopefully you have a great time this morning. A high level of uh, visitor satisfaction um, promotes sustainability. So not just do it, but actually teach people that it's really important so that when everyone visits here, when they walk away, they've got a reason to contribute themselves. Okay. Uh, and that's just the definition of sustainability at the bottom. Work hard to make sure that visitors tomorrow get the same experience or even a better one. All right. So that's what our view of what sustainable tourism should be doing. I'm gonna provide some examples about what we do. Um, we're not perfect, we make mistakes, we're still learning as we go. Uh, if you wanna challenge anything I'm saying, please do because um, you know, it's, uh, it's, we're learning as much as um, everyone else in the industry. So, what's Skyro, what are you about to do? Do you know much about what you're about to experience? No, okay. <laughs> so you know what the cableway is, so it's just like, Think of a ski gondola in um, Colorado, maybe. Uh, it's exactly that, but we go over the rainforest. It's one of the only ones in the world that goes over forest rather than ski fields or as a transport in a city. So it was really unique. Uh, it goes for seven and a half kilometers. So we are at Smithfield. You're about to go on a 15 minute ride up to Red Peak, which is up at 595 meters above sea level. So that is 1800 feet, something like that. So it's not a massive mountain but it's enough to change elevation so we've got a completely different rainforest community than what we get down in the bottom. Okay, so go up there, you'll have a guided um, option of a guided ranger uh, tour up there. We have a boardwalk completely raised off the um, forest floor so that we don't impact the ground there. Then we've got a 20 minute ride to Barren Falls or Din Din Falls. Uh, and then you will, there's a spectacular waterfall, especially in the wet season at the moment. Um, it's a bit of a trickle, but it's still spectacular. And then you've got a 10 minute ride to Karanda. Karanda is a very small village right at the top that relied on firstly mining and logging, like I said, and then it became a, like a honeymooners retreat because uh, it's cooler, it's about four or five degrees cooler. And here, this is like Southern Miami, I suppose, uh, climate wise. So in the wet season, it's really hot and stinky. Uh, it's a nice relief to go up 600 meters above sea level uh, up into Coranda. Um, and then it became a tourism town. Okay, so that a lot of uh, old streets opened up and new um, trinkets were made there and typical tourism items, okay, and cafes and things like that. So you get to Coranda at the end and then how are you getting yourself down? Are you doing the train? Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. And then you'll take the train back down to Cairns, which is run by the Queensland government. So this is a private company. The train is uh, run by the government. And that originally was built to get up there for that logging and, and mining, like I said. But now it's a, a tourism. I, I've been told that it's a significant revenue that Queensland Rail gets for from just that railway trip. Um, you know, it helps run all of the railway in Queensland because it's so, so popular. So that's what we are. It's seven and a half kilometres long, like I said. And that's an example of what you'll see. That's the Barren Gorge just there. So that's on the way to um, Din Din Falls. So you're about to take that. What's our vision? So we're family operated, family owned. Um, the Chapman family had a vision to do this, to promote, preserve the rainforest that we're here but also to make it a fantastic tourism experience. Um, so the vision is to provide the best rainforest experience available anywhere in the world. That's it's broad, but that's what we we're trying to do. So we're trying to improve our business all the time uh, to keep improving that uh, experience. We've got four grand pillars, which is encouraging people to love the rainforest and want to protect it and increase their knowledge of sustainability. Uh, and doing the right thing um, with protecting these lands. So the first one is to discover stuff. We try and encourage people to explore on their own as much as with the guided ranges, to have fun, but also we offer opportunities to contribute back to the community, which I'll talk about at the end. Um, 
And on top of all of that, our responsibility is to con uh, conserve natural heritage, biodiversity, uh, <coughs> cultural heritage. So um, how do we do that? We do that firstly by employing uh, me. It's really rare, I think in the States, it's a really rare thing to have public-private um, partnerships. Um, Ken Chapman and his family have actually employed myself on the environmental manager, but I've also got nine rangers underneath me. We're completely paid by Skyrail, and we manage the rainforest underneath Skyrail. So it's independent of the government. So like a park ranger in the United States, we work with rangers, um, government rangers. We work with Jabagai rangers. Uh, but we're employed solely by Skyrail to make sure that this rainforest stays in mint condition um, and is actually, I, my belief is that it's actually in better condition than it was before Skyrail was built because we're actively managing pest species and, and all of that sort of thing and getting access to parts of the rainforest and improving it um, that wouldn't otherwise be accessed. So um, my job is to make sure that you know what's happening but also to keep this place uh, pristine. How do we do this? So the discovery part, um, we've got ranger guided tours. So we go into the bush, we might spray, we might um, you know, get rid of any piece, pest species or anything like that, maintain vegetation. If we see vegetation that might be uh, you know, compromised, we try and um, manicure that vegetation if it's next to our boardwalk to make sure that it improves the health of the tree. Other than that, we don't touch anything. Okay, but we've got ranger guided tours that take you guys around the boardwalk, which is at Red Peak. So we do 20 minute guided tours uh, to show you all about and try and teach you a little bit about the rainforest. So up there this morning is Ty. So Ty is Jabagai. So he's a Jabagai ranger, local indigenous group. So he'll take you around uh, the boardwalk if you're interested in that um, when you get up there. It makes it easier for them to climb. They don't hop like your normal kangaroos. So. They climb right to the top of their canopy and they're not actually eating fruit, they eat leaves. So you'll find them right at the top of the canopy eating the new leaves at the top of, top of trees. We've got interpretive signage, uh, historical displays, uh, nature diary, press releases. So we, we sort of talk about things that we've found, um, new animals that are starting to come out into the, at different times of the year, flowers, all that sort of thing. So we try and promote the rainforest. Uh, and we've also got an app, so I, when you line up to get on, there's a QR code, highly recommend you um, scan that and then it'll talk about the rainforest as you go up, okay? So we provide opportunities for information. That's the discovery part. What about the explore part? Well, we've got boardwalks that you can go out over the lookout. Um, the boardwalks are all raised, so um, this, Rainforest community is extremely sensitive to root damage and things like that. They've got um, the, a lot of these plants and fungi actually communicate with one another as far as providing nutrients and all of that sort of thing. And these trees, all the root systems are interwoven. So um, it's not like each one is independently just standing there. These two trees here will have a root system that is intertwined. So it increases the stability of the forest it has really complex interactions with fungi and other species uh, to, to provide nutrients and things that we're only just beginning to understand. Um, so it's a really sensitive environment. So we've raised everything so that we're not having people trudge through, uh, trudge through the mud um, that, that would be created. We've got discovery zones and places where you can go and touch and feel and look at seeds and you know the big cassowary. Is anyone aware of what a cassowary is? I see them regularly every time I go into the bush. Uh, most times I'll see one. Um, that, but they've got a large range. They, they're kind of like a bear in North America. So you go for a walk and you'd love to see one in the distance. Not too close to you. But, um, you know, it's, all, it's exciting if you do see it. And it's the same with the cassowary. So I'm not guaranteeing you'll see one, but we do have them wandering around. Um, they have a, a range of about three square kilometres. Uh, that they need each individual needs to, to provide their nutrients. So those birds are 1.6 metres high, second heaviest bird in the world after an ostrich. So they're an impressive bird. I'll talk about them later. Um, so enjoyment, we want you guys to have fun. 
Uh, the gondola goes up to 40, 45 metres above the ground. So we are, you're actually skirting above the rainforest. There's not many places in the world where you get to look down on the canopy and actually go through the canopy at stages as well. So it's a unique way to look at the rainforest. Um, we have tree kangaroos. So most people know about kangaroos that eat the grass. The kangaroos in here, there's no grass in the rainforest because of competition. So the kangaroos in here are actually, uh, we've got Lumholtz tree kangaroos. They're about seven kilos high, uh, in weight, sorry. I don't know what that is in pounds, maybe 20 pounds? 15. 15. Uh, and they sit in the treetops and eat leaves only. Okay, they're very, very cute. You've got pictures of it at, um, uh, at Red Peak Station. But um, we have been seeing them maybe on a weekly basis uh, near Tower 10. So keep an eye out to your left. But we try and make, you know, increase the enjoyment, giving you those opportunities, flying across the top of the, the canopy, having a look at the waterfall, making it fun. The last pillar that we have is to contribute. Um, we've, got, we've developed the Skyrail Rainforest Foundation. So it's a foundation that allows people to either donate if you don't have any time, donating it gives proceeds to scientists to do further research on the rainforest. Tree, tree planting programs, education programs. Uh, we sponsor PhD students that are doing scientific research. Um, so far, somewhere around $800,000 has been um, donated through that Rainforest Foundation initiative. Uh, but people like myself, rangers, go out to the community and do tree plantings at different places too and talk about rainforest ecosystems and rainforest corridors and, and cassowaries and things like that. So. We give an opportunity for local people to contribute, but also everyone that, that goes on a uh, skyrail trip as well. So they're the four things that we look at, and obviously to conserve uh, the rainforest. So when the Chapmans decided to build this, this wasn't World Heritage. So World Heritage status, I think, was given in 1988. We've got state parks, okay, which are, are run by local government, and then we've got Commonwealth Government National Parks, which is the same as Yosemite or whatever it might be in the States. Uh, but then the international community has World Heritage Areas and they are identified by UNESCO, which is United Nations. Um, there's several in the United States, there's 200 and something in the world, I think. This World Heritage Rainforest is one of them, okay? So you have to, to get World Heritage status, you have to apply to UNESCO. Um, and you have to meet a whole bunch of criteria, or at least one of them. And this rainforest meets all of them, okay? So it gives you an example of evolutionary history of plants and animals. This rainforest has been around for more than 130 million years. It's the oldest rainforest continually surviving in the world by quite a margin, right? So these plants and animals have been in isolation. Australia's in the middle of nowhere. So it's been in isolation for that long um, you know, adapting with different conditions over time. So we've got very unique plants and animals. Uh, we've got cultural significance. I've mentioned that with Jabbai people being here for 60,000 years and using this rainforest for that long and all the stories that go with it. Um, we have, what is it, cultural beauty. So we've got, it's a, you have to be a, a place of significant beauty. Um, and a, a unique example of geological change. Okay, so Australia's drifted north. We used to be joined to Antarctica and we've floated slowly north over the last 40, 45 million years. And the ecosystems in Australia have changed. This uh, rainforest used to go all the way to Western Australia, okay, nearly Perth, so it covered all of Australia really. And it's retracted only into this little tiny corner now because um, all of the moisture coming off the ocean uh, is stopped by this mountain range and it's hot and humid up here and the water falls on this side of the mountain range and it's the only place left where Australia is not that dry, okay? So it's the only place left where we have this rainforest but it used to go all over the continent. So World Heritage status means that we meet all of those criteria, right? So it's a really special place. David Attenborough, everyone aware of him? <coughs> yeah, so David Attenborough has named uh, actually UNESCO and David Attenborough, this is his favorite spot. He's cited North Queensland, but um, UNESCO says this is the second most important ecosystem in, left in the world, okay, after uh, one of the national parks in Venezuela because of its, it's so unique, so isolated, 
been here for so long, uh, so different from everywhere else. So it's a really important spot. So to, to, um, to build this place, we had to be very, very careful. So the Chapmans um, committed to not disturbing it as, well, disturbing it as little as possible. So all the towers that hold the gondola up, everything was walked in. There were no roads made, no tracks. Everything had to be walked in or helicopter dropped. They hand dug the holes. So we're talking five or six metre holes that were, you know, and in the wet season here, you know, 35 degrees and 90% humidity, pretty unforgiving conditions. Um, so they hand dug the holes, hand filled it with concrete or with helicopters, and then they dropped the towers in piece by piece and they were constructed on site, bolted together one section at a time. So that means that we weren't, we didn't access anything by road. There is, uh, Barron Falls was an old farm, so we put the stations at places that had been disturbed before, but the actual virgin rainforest has been left. Um, yeah, so he was really particular and careful, but they were really particular and careful about how they constructed this thing. Um, the towers have a base of about seven by seven metres. So anything, they, they picked sites where there were no large trees and anything that they had to move, they moved every sapling, removed it off site, did their work, and then we replanted every sapling that we could after it. So it was re-vegetated. Re my job uh, is to make sure that the vegetation doesn't touch the towers or the gondolas, but apart from that, we don't touch uh, the rainforest here. So they went out of their way to make sure we've minimised the impact. Um, like I said, this place is unique. That's a tree king. That's not a very good photo, but that's a tree king right there. Okay, so it looks a little bit like a possum. Um, very, very shy, but they're super cute. We have best practice here. We try to drive improvement in these things, and I'll explain why or how we do that in a minute. Um, but we try to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, energy efficiency, minimise our water, our con ecosystem conservation, um, air quality, noise reduction. We look at all of that sort of thing, and our waste minimisation and recycling program. So I'm just about to put a new waste management system in, which um, all of our bottles go to. Um, containers for change and all of those proceeds now are going to go straight into the Rainforest Foundation. So all of the, you know, if you've got a bottle of water, put it in the recycling bin and that all, all those proceeds go back into Rainforest Foundation, which is, um, you know, little initiatives like that sort of add up. Um, looking at air quality and noise, the, there's a road that goes up to Coranda. If we've got several thousand passengers going on this cableway each day to get themselves to Coranda, like you guys are as a tourist, it reduces significantly the number of buses, cars, trucks, all of those sort of things that are using the road. So it's a very efficient way to get there, but not only that, we're removing traffic from the roadways and, and local uh, other ways to get up there. Okay, so um, we're trying to do that and promote the use of the cableway in that way as well. Um, we're looking at solar, we've got a, uh, power station here that is uh, powered by water, so it's a sustainable um, power station. A lot of the power stations in Australia, unfortunately, are still coal, uh, coal and gas, so we're lagging behind the rest of the world in a lot of aspects as far as clean energy goes, but we're trying to do our best to um, use off-grid. We've got electric vehicles for our cars now, all of that sort of thing, which I know that you'll far more progressed in the United States, but in Australia, it's actually a big deal to have an electric car. I think only, I think we're up to 3% of Australia's cars are electric, okay? Whereas, I don't know what it is in the States, but hands up if you've got an electric car in your family. Few people, yeah, yeah, So 3%, it's still really, really, like it's exciting to see one here still, unfortunately, but we're working towards that. Um, all right, last little section here, and then I'll open it up for any questions, and then you can get on the spot rather than enjoy it. How do we do it? Um, we've got a team of us. So the rangers that I work with are super passionate about this. They've dedicated their lives to conservation. They've all either gone to uni or done uh, certificate courses in conservation management. Uh, and we love telling the story. So, um, so we've got passionate rangers that try and give the information out to the local public and turn it into a story of, oh, it's just a bunch of trees to how important this ecosystem actually is. Why do we do it? Lots of reasons, you could answer that in lots of ways. The most important thing is because it's the right thing to do. 
um, we could do it and not have any concerns with the environmental or the community impacts. But that's bad for our business. Not only is it that, but what's, what's the point? Why would we do that? We can make the same money. We can promote it in a way that it's going to be an, still an attraction by still improving you know, uh, cultural relations, employing local people, making sure we're preserving the rainforest. So it's a no-brainer to, to try and improve sustainability. Um, but the other thing is, because it's fun, <laughs> these guys dedicate their lives to it, um, and also because this place is fragile. So, um, you know, there's several reasons for it. Development, climate change, could be all, all, all manner of reasons, but because we're in this little thin strip of rainforest left, there's not much to preserve. So if we make sure that what is there is really healthy and what's at their edges is my passion, I suppose. If you try and reduce the edge effects on a national park, you're maintaining it forever, okay? so. We, when National Park started, uh, the philosophy really was to put a fence up, don't let anyone in, all right? But the more that we develop, the more industry gets closer to the edges, the hotter it gets on the edges, the windier it gets, and the forest de deteriorates over time. So gone are the days where we just lock an area off and say, that'll do. We need to actively manage it, right? So our philosophy is to make sure that these trees are healthy, not just lock them off from everyone, but make sure that we're actively, you know, uh, contributing to making it a better environment. That's why we do it. Also, like I said, it makes good business sense, yeah? So we, you have to make money to employ people, and that's um, one way to do it as well. Okay, uh, a couple of last things before I, forget, uh, before I <coughs> open it up to you guys. We have an environmental management plan. Um, I can send some things to you as well after this if you'd like. Well, we've got an environmental management plan. It's a document sort of more than 100 pages long and it is the guidelines for the business, everyone in this business that we have to follow to make sure that um, we've got, uh, we take care of the environmental risks, uh, that we go through processes so that this rainforest is not impacted by anyone. So we've got 120 people plus that work for Skyrail across different departments. So the ranges are no worries. We, that, that's our thing, environmental stuff. But when you look at the engineers who are maintaining the place, um, what's it to them? They're just trying to fix a bull wheel or whatever it is, and you know, but this environmental management plan uh, makes sure that every single department is trying to do their bit. Uh, it's not just the people on the ground that are making the difference, right? So we make sure that we educate the engineers, the people in the retail shop, um, the marketing people, uh, whoever it is, the, the uh, women and men in the office just behind us here uh, doing all the paperwork. We make sure that they try, uh, they're on board with it as well. So we've got an environmental management plan and the big one, I have to look after this, is earth check certification. So it's all good to say, yep, we're gonna try and do this, but we've employed earth check to come in and audit us every single year and make sure that we're delivering on our promises. So like I said, we're not perfect, but what we're trying to do is make things a little bit better each year. And then the difference between 20 years ago and now is really noticeable. So next year we'll try and implement new things and, and keep all the old things in. Has anyone heard of Spire EarthCheck? So EarthCheck, EarthCheck is, I think it's an Australian company originally, but it's now global and tourism companies can employ EarthCheck and they come and do a full audit and they do it every year and it's not cheap but they assess our power use, our water use, um, the plastic bags that we use or don't use, uh, where our water comes from, or just everything you can think of, where we store our chemicals, how we transfer petrol when we have to use a chainsaw to, um, you know, we have, might have a sick tree and we've got to, uh, you know, access a limb, have to take the chainsaw into the rainforest, how do we take that uh, petrol without spilling it, do we bleach our boots before we walk into the rainforest so that we're not pollinating uh, weeds and things like that in the rainforest? So they come and do a week audit. It takes about, it takes about a couple of months for them to write it up. And that says, you're doing a good job here, you're doing a good job there, have you thought of this? That's really bad, let's change it. Okay, so we employ them to make sure that we're, you know, trying to do the best that we can. We're also part of Ecotourism Australia. Um, Cairns is now being marketed as an ecotourism hub, all right? So 
one of our Queensland strategies is to say this is an ecotourism hotspot. This is where all of our businesses are going to try and commit to being eco-certified, which means that we're improving our business as we go. Uh, and that's helping gener generate, you know, people are now interested in environmental tourism. They want to choose the right thing to do. They don't want to just go overseas anymore and go to, well, Australians go to Bali. I don't know where you guys go, Mexico or wherever it might be. It's not, it's not just a choice of the cheapest flight anymore. They want to go there, but then do the right thing. Okay, so this area here has committed to that and we're part of um, Ecotourism Australia as far as that certification goes. And the last thing is we try and employ local people only. Up until COVID, that was true. Everyone here was a local and we try to put money back into the community and employ only local people. When COVID happened, uh, it was a little bit different to how it happened in the States. Australia pretty much went into lockdown and this business closed down for nine months without one customer because of border closures. So I, I went, I actually took leave. I was going to travel with my family for nine months across Europe and Asia. And I went down to my mum and dad down in Victoria, Southern Australia, uh, to say hi and goodbye for a couple of weeks. But then COVID happened and I was stuck on my sister-in-law's lounge room floor for six months because I wasn't allowed to cross the border to come back home. I don't know if that happened in the States, in any of the, of the States, but if you can imagine living in California and you go and visit your friend or your mum in Texas before you went on a trip, and then all of a sudden Texas said you can't leave because or California wouldn't let you back. That's what happened here. So I slept on my mother-in-law's, um, she, she lived near the beach, so it was okay. But um, I slept on her uh, sister, sister in law, sorry, slept on her floor for six months. Had to wait until the borders opened. As soon as the borders opened, I could come back to Queensland and I tried to find work again back at home. So you can imagine how unsettling that is. We didn't have a worker here, oh, sorry, a, a customer here for nine months. The Chapmans did not uh, put anyone off. So a lot of people decided to go home because, you know, they were hurting and they needed to be with their family and all of that sort of thing. But anyone that wanted to stay, the Chapman family found a job for them here, even though we were closed. So that commitment to local community is really like, I take my hat off to, to the owners of this business because that's a, that's a massive commitment, uh, as you can understand. We got government incentives. So the government did do handouts to people that were unemployed, uh, sorry, to businesses that had, you know, employers but no customers. Uh, but they committed to that. Um, I've been through all of that. As a result, we've got lots of tourism awards. Um, you can go onto our website. That's what I'd recommend, going onto the website and having a look at what initiatives we've got, all of the sustainability stuff and the awards that we've received. Um, but you, you take care of the environment, you take care of the local community, and the money, you've got to work hard, but the money takes care of itself. Okay, so that's my message to you is that um, if you do do the right thing, then actually the money comes and it comes improved, new and improved. So uh, that's the philosophy for Skyrail. Um, and that's it for my presentation, but I wanted to open up the floor. It doesn't have to be sustainable related or if you would like me to address anything in particular. Yes, mate. When you're managing a rainforest like for invasive species, yep. Do you find that international or like within Australia species are worse? Because like we went through like all the biosecurity measures, but yep. I know like if something coming from a different part of Australia it would be a bigger problem. Yeah, so a um, bit of both. So when Australia was open up to Europeans firstly, uh, with, because we've been isolated for so long, it was the same as North America, but because we've been isolated so long, uh, things like rabbits <coughs> were, you think rabbits are, you know, harmless, but they've caused irreparable damage to this land. And most of it was people, like English people, often Scottish, would come over, they'd have a plot of land, and they used to hunt over there traditionally. And they're like, well, there's nothing to hunt here other than the odd kangaroo, so I'm gonna release some rabbits, release some foxes, and then I can go hunting with my friends. And so all of a sudden, we've got these massive uh, pest species problem. Uh, foxes, rabbits, pigs are a big one here. Um, and as far as the trees and plants go, a lot of the vine, invasive vines from Southeast Asia grow really well here. 
So um, there's not really any plants that we get from the rest of Australia that worry us or animals because they don't survive well in this environment. But plants that are, there's a plant called Myconia, which is a real problem in um, Hawaii, I think, but also in other parts, it's from South America, uh, is it South American? I think it might be South American. Rainforest plant, but it is, has this really invasive, um, it grows really fast, massive leaves, overshadows everything and everything dies underneath it. So the answer is international species pests are, are really uh, problematic because we've got similar ecosystems to overseas, but other animals in Australia, um, they love the dry lands, which doesn't, doesn't affect us as much, yeah. Pigs are our big problem for animals. Um, lantana is our biggest problem for plants, which is a vine that sort of smothers trees. Yeah, so we, we go in and look after that a bit. But it's almost um, not a problem anymore, which is great, yeah. Oh, cane toad, have you heard of a cane toad? Yeah, some people have. Massive toad, uh, that, that big. There's uh, cane farmers came in here about 100 years ago and planted in the lowlands. But we have cane beetles that started eating all the cane. So they introduced cane toad from South America and it worked. They ate cane beetles. But they've got poisonous glands on the back of their neck and all of our animals, uh, snakes, you know, rodents, uh, marsupials, they thought, oh, new food source, and they started eating them, but then they'd all die. So if you ate a cane toad, the animal would die. So these cane toads have now spread from, they were released in Gordonvale, which is the next town south, and they've spread all the way across the country in the north, <coughs> and they've reached Sydney now, I think, or close to Sydney. Um, the animals are adapting, but big mistake, because we've lost, um, we've reduced a lot of species of snakes uh, and marsupials because of, yeah, uh, any other questions? Yes. So SkyRail took some pretty strong stances on employment and right. corporate social responsibility with regards to the oh. pandemic. Yeah. What? How do you think that impacted the number of people who came back to work? Yeah. So, uh, really positively. So we've uh, SkyRail has a good reputation because of that. Uh, it's got a reputation of a good place to work because of the stability that it offers um, and. We try and create good career progression as well. So I think it's been, you know, it's cost them money in the short term, but in the long term, I think it's a, a really positive move. Yeah. So people here are often quite loyal. I've just employed a person to come across from another department into the ranger department this week because they've been here as a housekeeper, so cleaning for four or five years, and they commit. They just he said to me in the interview, I want to retire here. So we've offered him another opportunity so that he stays interested. So um, yeah, it really does work. So if you show loyalty to your uh, employees, employees will show loyalty to you, yeah, for sure. Um, COVID really did knock Australia for six. So there are some people that left and they haven't returned, but that's, that's just the nature of a big, big country. It takes a long, Brisbane is our next city, next big city and it's, Two and a half thousand kilometres away. So what's that? 1,500, uh, 1,800 miles away is our next city of significance. Other than that, it's just small towns. So it's like going through Midwest United States, little towns like that, all the way to Brisbane. So if you live in Brisbane, it takes a lot to come back. Yeah. So so the short answer is yeah, it's, it's really. <coughs> yeah. Any other questions? Last chance for animals or anything like that that you want to see before you go, yes? Would you say invasive species is the biggest challenge for preservation or is there something else? Which species? Invasive. Oh, which What's invasive? The um, cane toads for, in general, cane toads. Are you talking about for this rainforest or Australia? In general. In general. So in Australia, uh, cats, foxes, rabbits. Okay, so really destructive to the soil. Um, we've got a really dry environment usually, so the soil structure is super important. If you destroy, if you go to, I don't know what you guys have, if you've done any soil science, but soil science sounds really boring until you get into it and how important soil is and the structure of the nutrients in there. So foxes, rabbits, cats have really killed a lot of things. Here, cane toads, uh, pigs, uh, and myconia, which is that invasive, Plants, yeah, 
I should say too, I'll give you my email address. If you guys have any questions about sustainability initiatives or invasive species or anything like that, or you're doing a project, I don't know what you're doing for your assessment, I'm happy to answer anything at any time, all right? So um, I'll send that to you and you can email, email me anything. It doesn't have to be SkyRail related either. It could be anything. Um, Cause I'm passionate about educating people. It's important that people realise that this stuff matters. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Sir. Just a quick one. What's yep. your like educational background? Myself. Yeah. So I went to high school down in southern New South Wales. So in a country town, Midwest sort of sort, sort of <laughs> town. Uh, did my schooling there at a public school, um, and then travelled. Was a diver for ages. Loved. Some, I did some ranger work and loved it, so I did a Bachelor of Science from that. And so, really in, uh, in zoology. So I specialised in animals, uh, and then that led me to doing talks and things like that, and so then I did education. So I've got a Bachelor of Science in zoology, a postgraduate diploma in education, and then I was a uh, high school teacher for 20 years. And now I'm back into the ranging stuff. Because who wants to be a high school teacher anymore? <laughs> no, they're important. I just, it was time. It was either I move and do, do something exciting now or, or keep in the industry and I decided to bite the bullet. But yeah, uh, Bachelor of Zoology. Um, marine Biology is James Cook University here. If anyone's interested in oceans and things like that, there's a lot of information for James Cook University for that sort of thing. Yeah. All right, any last minutes? I should let you go. You've been in, locked in a dark room for an hour <laughs> and you should be looking at the rainforest.